So we're going to look at uh, some of the background to the lecture series Jesus to Christ. And what I want to do here is first off have a look at uh, the relationship between the film The Wizard of Oz and its relation to the present time. So we see right now at the present time as we speak, August the 1st, we have Uranus conjunct Mars and conjunct the North Node around 20 degrees of Taurus. And this is exactly the same uh, conjunction, the same part of the, the, star, the starry sky it's the same position as it was in 1939, which was the uh, release of The Wizard of Oz. And why is this important? I want to bring the, the um, connection here between the, this, this film, which has this important moment where it transfers from black and white with the whirlwind um, in Kansas around Dorothy and how it lifts her house up. We have this huge whirlwind. She then goes up into the sky, spins around, and she lands then after this down in the land of Oz. And she kills then the wicked witch of the east and we can just i'd just like to transfer here over we're just going to look at this period this um point where dorothy then lands in the land of oz and we see here um a kind of unstable understanding of her own identity as a witch um when she speaks here to the witch of the north when we see um what has actually um transpired what has actually happened so we're just gonna um move over to this So we see here, um, Dorothy is not fully um, aware of what's happened to her, although she is perceiving all around her that a new world that she's entered into. She's not fully aware of the fact that she's perceived by the Good Witch of the North as a very powerful witch who has killed the Wicked Witch of the East. And he's now surrounded, he's now the heroine of Munchkin land. Now, there's very, very much a wisdom woe into this, um, into this story by Phil Baum, who was a theosophist. Um, one can find numerous parallels to, but I want to stay here focused on, on this relationship between 1939 and the time that we are presently in. Because if we look to look at a number of aspects, uh, back to one of the um, key things that I feel is important for the present time, which is this rediscovery, this re un re re um, yeah rediscovery of what the Christian mysteries are. Now, this is going to be counterposed by what Jesuitism is, which is um, maybe a good word not known to everybody, but if we talk about it in terms of scientific materialism and the problem of materialism and the problem of the spirit, then we can come close to understanding that we are on the brink of understanding a new relationship to Christ, what traditionally has been called more esoteric Christianity and its links to spirituality and 
the occult. Now, this is something that has always been throughout history repressed by the more overt teachings of the church. So we see here if the understanding of Jesuitism is diametrically opposed to an understanding of esoterics and the occult. Now, this is very different from the new age perspective of of all kinds of spiritual teachings and we will we'll go into this a bit later it's it's a different appreciation of this and it's something that we can we will come to understand in humanity in a in a more distant future but we can understand start to understand some of these mysteries now now to summarize some of this, I've, I've developed this flyer, um, which is showing here, first of all, how one of the key concepts of anthroposophy that is kind of summed up in this expression, we're not in Kansas anymore. And you see here the deep wisdom behind Dorothy um, going through this whirlwind and coming, her whole perceptive reality has changed even into a more technicolor world that then bursts through at some point in the in the film. And this is again one of the one of the key aspects of the importance of the Wizard of Oz for audiences at the time because it was this glorious glorious technicolor that arises and what this mirrors is the whole um awakening to a clairvoyant perception of a whole other spiritual world behind the senses and this is something that um rudolf steiner identified in the middle of the 19th century humanity as a whole took this step this this step over the threshold of the spiritual world. Now, why this is important is that Dorothy is very much representative of us as an individual trying to navigate our own spiritual development in light of the fact that the whole of humanity has taken this step over the border to the spiritual world. And you see this reflected in many ways where her whole family, the people around her, are then uh, changed into the characters that she met, then meets in the Land of Oz, from her aunt and uncle to the Wicked Witch to the, to the wizard that she finally meets. Now, if we look here at the flyer, we've got... I've identified here some of the the lines that come into the moment when they speak to um, sing to Dorothy as they they welcome her as their heroine, as their savior for the killing of the wicked witch of the east. And again, this is reflective of our own personal awakening and understanding. This Wicked Witch of the East is really, from a, a cult perspective, a reflection of what is it that lives in our astral body? What is it that lives in our desires, our understanding of life? Now, anyone who goes on, on that first step of starting to question the spiritual basis of reality is going to meet themselves in this figure of Dorothy as they question, as the old world of materialism in our thinking has now died, has been killed. Now, this can come from, from Christ situations. All of this is, is mirrored in the whirlwind where events are outside of our understanding, outside of our, um, our conscious appreciation of what's going on. So in the the song when they're singing to Dorothy when she first arrives in Munchkin land, we've got these, the words here, the Jesuit as coroner, I must aver, 
I thoroughly examined her and she's not only merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. Now that is the scientific materialistic uh, worldview that sees our understanding of life as a purely materialistic one. Now that's the description of the, the Wicked Witch of the East as a corpse. It's the analysis of that relation to, to matter and to the spiritual world as the only interest here is in man, mankind as a corpse. And we can see this in numerous understandings of from medicine uh, to, to the whole economic system that un, underpins this, to view the human being as a corpse. Now, a living understanding is what Dorothy is as ourselves, the understanding that one's being is related to humanity as a whole. And that is a living understanding of reality, which then enables this awakening to a whole new world. So that's the Rosicrucian path that we're looking at here. Let the joyous news be spread. The wicked old witch at last is dead. We fully understand this and we fully understand the joy of this new world that we've gone into. And this is kind of reflected very nicely in Dorothy's own um, expression on meeting this new world. There's a kind of trepidation and kind of fear, but there's also a joy in seeing that we're not in Kansas anymore. And we're seeing things from a very different new perspective. Now, the, the munchkins that are surrounding her here, this is the other source of occult understanding in the world, pre-Masonic. So holding ancient traditions of what it means to understand the spiritual in the world, then the church on one side. On the other side, we've got the pre-Masonic um, tradition. Now, here we've got the threefold um, song talking about the Lollipop Guild and there's a kind of sense of ownership that the pre-Masonic uh, wisdom has for what are the traditional paths into this world. And whether we call it the Freemasonic here or the esoteric traditions of other religions, it's that tradition that we've carried over that's, that's not fully consciously understood. So let's go back and we're just gonna then look at um, look at the when Dorothy then arrives in let's um let's just have a look at Dorothy in Munchkin land and just get a sense of this Now we see here um, the beginning here of a river and a pond. Now this is significant because when we look back at the the um, position now that I was talking about, 1920 degrees Taurus with Uranus and Mars. This position back in 1939 is mirrored at this time. So this is just before the outbreak of the Second World War. You see the whole importance here of propaganda, of the use of the news and how it then facilitated everything that happened in, in the Second World War. Now, what we've got mirroring here is this 100 year anniversary between 1920 and 2020, the Treaty of Versailles, which set up the possibility for all of what then happened later with the Second World War. This is mirroring in 2020. And we're going to look at also some of the um, star um, conjunctions of December 21st, 2020 and look at how that Saturn-Jupiter conjunction 
is setting up a mirroring of many of these events of the 20th century. Now, this, me pointing out this river is important because what we've got here is a relationship to a certain star and constellation around that point, which in the sky is known as the river. Now, if we look at this, I put some of this information here on the um, bear with me. So yeah, here, what we're looking, this is what some of what I'm saying here, this is the great conjunction December 21st, 2020, we see um, sitting exactly here together. Now, the, the, we've got here, we'll come back to this the relationship between Saturn and Jupiter. But here we've got here, 20 degrees Taurus is the star of Rana. Now this relates to the love of knowledge, science, much many changes, position of authority, accidents at sea. So uh, this river constellation is right next to some very difficult star constellation constellations, notably Medusa the Gorgon's head, which comes at 26 degrees Taurus. But at 20 degrees Taurus, we have this, the river, the constellation which traverses several signs. Now we see here, the Wizard of Oz is picking this up and showing this river as part of this yellow brick road, accompanying it with this image of the river. And this constellation is also known as, and has reference to the frog. So we see here also the in the um in the freeze frame that i've got here of the river we have the river constellation here and the lily and the, the frogs which are all referred to here but let's go back and just get some uh what we're going to do is um, on the conjunction 21st of December 2020. Now, why is this important? We have Saturn and Jupiter. We have here reference to three great conjunctions around the time of Christ. We first of all have the great conjunction of 6 BC. This is when we have the star observed by the Magi, observed from the east, in reference to the, the tradition of Zoroastra as the golden star or Zarathustra, Zarathustra in Bethlehem in Israel. With this Zarathustra then is this reference to ancient clairvoyant star knowledge to seek their great teacher, who is then going, we're going to see the incarnation of this great teacher in Jesus. Therefore, this corner of the zodiac carries the great annunciation theme for humanity. This is the corner which corresponds to the great conjunction of 2020. Now we have here the other two corners representing 14 AD and the great conjunction of 34 AD. So what we have here is 20 years. This first one, we have the esoteric knowledge from 14 BC to 34 BC, the esoteric knowledge inaugurating the new advent of Christ, the turning point of time with these three kings of the East. 
So this is a reminder to us of clairvoyant knowledge as it had been kept in the East as a preservation of a knowledge that this point, this turning point of time with the incarnation of Christ would be coming at this time. So they're looking for this conjunction. Now we have the, the new preparation of the social incorporation of Christ in the body of that tradition is the community of the Christian disciples. Now this, if we understand this and we understand 2020, and if we look back at the shock that came in January 2020, we then see that actually everything that had started to happen to in 2020 was an unraveling of the world that had previously existed. Now, part of this lying behind the scenes is a kind of economic collapse. So look back, part of what we're talking about here with the analogy of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz is to be able to look back on your own experience of this whole period and look back of your own experience of reality and how it started to ask many, many questions for humanity as a whole, socially, also for yourself, how do you relate to this new re reality? Now, a lot of this started with the, the things that happened after 2020 and even my reticence of speaking about some of these things shows the depths of change that have occurred since 2020 because I'm even censoring being careful about what I say. Now these developments have affected the economy, they've affected politics, they've affected our very relationship to other people, to the people that we know. There's been like a split in some senses, you can say some people get it and some people see many things that are happening in the world and asking many, many questions. Now, I'm not going to go into those things. I think it's just to call that to mind all the things that have been going on and the changes that have happened since that beginning of 2020, which again is mirroring what happened in 1920 with the Treaty of Versailles. And in relation to anthroposophy, this is also 1920. We're coming up to the last months before the burning of the first Gautianum. Now, all of this is significant because when we think of the community of disciples at the time of Christ, we have to put ourselves into that time and really feel what it meant to live under the repressive authority of the state at that time. Well, now, when you do that, you realize that not only is Christianity a very radical uh, message about a new world, but it's also a very practical message about how we relate as individuals to that world. So this is the community, this is the community of Christian disciples as they facilitate the incarnation of Christ and how they, these dynamics enable that to happen and the individual's own relationship to all of these things is what we see depicted in the Gospels. So part of a, an understanding in this new time of the Christian mystery is to see that Golgotha, the story of Christ's incarnation is and the resurrection is underpinning everything that humanity is going through right down to the challenges that are coming now. So this is part of the, the significance of looking, for example, at, artwork, at an artwork such as Wizard of Oz and its relationship to 1939 because many of the experiences of the 20th century, we are being called to 
re-enliven and bring in relation to the Christian mystery. Now, the third conjunction of this time of Golgotha was the opening of the mysteries to the Gentiles through Paul. This is the beginning of the possibility of an individual experience of Christ in the etheric. So what I want to show here, I'll just share it here so you can read along with me. These are the three, our times are mirroring the times after Christ. Are we seeing here mirrored in these 20 years, 14 BC to 34 BC, 2000 to 2020? tradition inaugurating the new advent of Christ. These are the three keys of the East. This is the first level. Understanding initiate wisdom, understanding of the stars, and the place of humanity in the unfolding of history in a spiritual sense. The second level is the importance of a community of disciples. And again, in reference to what I was saying, this is where we all look to how we are socially relating to the events that are taking place in the world. And the more we awaken to this, the more we take on this role of Dorothy as someone going on a spiritual path. Now, the two are interlinked because the new mysteries of Christ are the relationship between spiritual wisdom and how individuals incorporate that wisdom and how this is the beginning, the possible beginnings of completely new social structures. Now, again, many of these questions are being asked again at the present time. And again, see also reflected the Roman state, just like at the time of Christ. We have forms, institutions that haven't moved on, that have stayed stuck. And bringing those into a spiritual relation is part of the challenge, the ongoing challenge that humanity faces. So this is then... The th we then sink down to a deeper level outside of those as Dorothy waking up to this. We have the possibilities that these mysteries are, th are teachings and understandings of the world that can come to be known by the world at large. Now, the Jesuit impulse is the, the seeking to eradicate out any knowledge of how this might take place or any knowledge of the spiritual nature of the return of Christ. What we're referring to here is return of, the, of Christ in the etheric. If you think of spiritual, um, of materialistic science in its wish to deny the soul and spirit of man, and on the other hand, what's presented through occult or esoteric science and through astrology is to understand the clairvoyant perception of the human being in relation to a new mystery of Christ as it breaks into humanity at the present time and since the middle of the 19th century. So what are we carrying in our souls to the future? There is a chance here that we turn to Christ 180 degrees instead of denying Christ in our lives. Now, all of us, everyone who's going through these transits, this is the underlying reality of what's going on. And again, this is not a traditional Christianity. This is a completely new esoteric understanding of Christianity. Now, a lot of this comes into uh, 
a lot of this comes into an understanding of the relationship between Saturn and Jupiter. Now, if we look at the process of incarnation, we have Saturn on the edge of the zodiac. And it's calling to mind, the important thing here is calling to mind how when we come from this, this, the constellations outside of the zodiac, and we come down in the process of incarnation, it's a slow forgetting of our spiritual home in the stars. And it's a, a slowly thickening and forgetting of that our home between death and a new birth. So going through the Saturn sphere is where all of this life that we previously had in the spiritual world is darkened. It creates like a dark cave. And it's this process of Saturn, that the mysteries of Saturn are understanding how this dark cave is formed by darkening our appreciation of our karma and our relationship to the stars that we had before birth. So if we then, if we go through this process and understanding the darkness, we think of also John, the light shone in the darkness, but the darkness did not understand it. This traditional understanding of Saturn as discipline and um, the school of hard knocks and all of this form that Saturn is bringing is this, this dark cave that is formed in the consciousness. And yet we have to keep on going through this Saturn experience to keep on finding our path into incarnation. Now, if we understand this in terms of the spiritual path, it's the process of needing to keep on going with that image of beauty that leads us, that is going to lead us deeper into this awakening of a new world, as we see with Dorothy in the land of Oz. Now, through doing this, if we then take, if we understand this dark cave, which prepares us for this, then we come we come, we emerge into this world of Jupiter. Now, if we hold these two together in conjunction, we have the possibility of, of something very, very profound, which is understanding that Saturn and Jupiter, this process of limit and discipline of Saturn and this will it wish to grow out and understand the universe from Jupiter. This is kind of forming a dialectic at the present time through this conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. Now mirroring, if this mirrors these three events of the time of Christ with the initiates seeing the birth of Christ coming, the forming of, of the group of disciples around Christ to make this happen with him. And then the possibility of Paul awakening to Christ in the etheric. We see these three challenges being triggered by Jupiter and Saturn. Now, why is this the case? Let's go somewhat deeper into this understanding. Now you can follow up the importance of these two stories. You've got the story of faithful John, the fairy tale from Brothers Grimm, is the process of Saturn. And Jupiter is the story of the goose girl. Now, this is very well described by Schramm in his book, 
about these processes. And this is, this is what I've identified here as crows create the labyrinth. So part of understanding that as humanity is over in this world, we have Yeah. Crows create the labyrinth. Now, what does this mean? If we understand these fairy tales as images and also understand part of the challenge of the present time, understanding of what's going on in an occult sense, messages come to us and in the, the fairy tales this is all this message first understandings of occult knowledge is represented by crows yeah it's even a stage in the process of initiation that you can be the crow signifies the first step of initiation to sit, receive messages from the spiritual world now these messages are starting to show us how the world around us is building this dark cave. Now we see here in the image here, this labyrinth surrounded in darkness and this image of the Greek figure here on the brink of making his way through the maze and this is the story then of theseus and the minotaur that he's going to find at the middle now i'm bringing this here in relationship to saturn saturn is this the planet that creates this dark cave that enables the incarnation process so part of what I've described here as the apocalyptic lessons in the dark cave are that labyrinths in Greek are skillfully wrought. They are skillfully built. From a Rosicrucian perspective, this is that we learn to skillfully understand the laws of the occult world. Within this, when we understand this, they are vehicles of test and change. So this process of spiritual development, and we see this on a very individual le level in relationship to the last two years, where do we feel, where do we pursue this path of test and change in relation to all the challenges that we are being faced with in this time. They are wandering, meaningful and peaceful. Yet there is only one passage through. Real life begins when you kill the monster at its core, the monster you have become, for the labyrinth makes you a minotaur until your lost time impels new fire in your eye to blaze forth from the gods these words i've tried to put into words here some of the realities of the spiritual path that help us move through this understanding of saturn as the dark cave where at the center of this dark cave is like the corpse, the dead body that we saw referenced in Jesuitism. So that materialistic scientific understanding of the human being as a dead body, that's creating the monster. If we look at this consciously, 
that we find at the middle of the labyrinth. So this whole image of the Minotaur in the labyrinth is really calling us to have the courage to go into that darkness and find what it is for us to really take hold of, of our I, of our Ich, in relation to, to the gods, in relationship to the spiritual world. And so some things are very, are best represented in images. And this image I feel is very helpful to see how the light begins to start shining in the darkness. And this little emoji here of the, the mermaid, the reference here we can also find back to Odysseus in the dark cave and his relationship to Calypso before he then sees the importance of this relationship to rediscover this relationship to the gods that can help him move out of the dark cave and then into this more conscious appreciation of Jupiter. So when we come to, when we bring this, this understanding of, that we've gained through understanding Saturn, and we've arisen out of this dark cave, we're then seeing deeper into our relationship to our own body. Now, Jupiter is then governing the chakra that we have here, the, the two petaled chakra. And this, the possibility here is this understanding of truths in the world, which is reflected very nicely in the story of the Goose Girl, where we see that somehow through, through this or through lack of understanding of these things, an imposter has come to take the true position of the princess. And I would encourage you to, to read the story because it will help you to understand this relationship to the guardian of the threshold, to our own doppelganger, and how we need to understand the doppelganger, the guardian of the threshold, so that we can start to more fully take hold of the thinking power here of Jupiter. So I'm just going to touch on that now and leave it. There. So I'll put this whole document in the, or the link to this in the underneath. So we have this relationship to the second half of 2022. The here we have the reference I made previously to Taurus, to this river as the constellation, this river that's going to help us navigate this step into the spiritual world. Now, this is being evoked right now at the present time and in this relationship back to 1939. Can we see a need here to re-engage with the terrible disasters of the Second World War and how this established the whole 1945 post-Second World War New World Order? And can we understand and recognize what was done there consciously a part of this is understanding the role of the media, the role of propaganda, and a need to understand this in an occult sense. And all of this is very then um, very finely depicted in The Wizard of Oz. So I wouldn't be put off by the seeming harmless um, 
superficial nature of the Wizard of Oz. It really could contain some very deep wisdom. Now, just six degrees on from Rana, we have Algol's, the star Algol, which again is referring to the Gorgon's head, the Medusa, and is a very unfortunate um, position. And what I found interesting in these two references is at 24 degrees Taurus, we have Capulus as primitive male sexual energy, ruthless, penetrating dishonesty. Here we have primitive female sexuality, beheading, strangulation, murder, violence. And if you see these two stars reflected in, in some of the atrocities of, of World War II, you can see here the importance of understanding everything that's going on from the position of Rana as a love of knowledge before it descends a few degrees later into these two, the effects of these two stars. Now, this has found expression in the full moon of the total lunar, lunar eclipse in Scorpio of May the 16th, 2022. And Again, I would encourage you to recognize the stars, recognize where they fall in your own horoscope. Also, look back in this time, think about some of the experiences that you might have gone through at that time and try to form a more imaginative understanding of how these dynamics are playing out in your life. So are you seeing your own relationship to a path of knowledge following this river constellation? And do you see this challenge, this Saturn challenge of the Medusa of these two, these two planets of, and we're talking here about sexual energy expressed then outwardly as violence and war when in their true aspects they should be the the drive for knowledge the drive from for, for self-knowledge that not is not going to allow this energy to dissipate into conflict and violent outer manipulation and in many cases evil so you see here very much we're in a in a ongoing battle of light and darkness that is bringing up unresolved aspects from the 20th century So there's a nice quote here um, in the astrology of fate, Liz Green writes that Scorpio drives us into collision with all that is terrifying, dark and destructive in life. Ruling the underworld, Scorpio exhumes what has been made abject, forcing us to face our fears. Green likens Scorpio to the snake haired Medusa a demon hag whose face is a, a portrait of feminine anger and hatred, capable of turning any beholder to stone. Some versions of the myth cast Medusa as a survivor of violation at the hands of the ocean god Poseidon. Her visage, a testament to the horrors of her experience. Medusa sees, survives and bears the unthinkable what has been seen cannot be unseen. So Scorpio is this, this sign that brings us through the depths of darkness to finally have the strength to behold the truth. 
So for this to, to have its eclipse at this time when opposite this this star of Rana <clears throat> with the north node at the time, Scorpio is on the south node. So this looking past look at the karma of everything that happened at that time. And hopefully for some of us, it's the possibility to really go into the karma of the Second World War to see its relation back to 1920, see the importance of that year of 1920, the burning of the first Gopianum, a significant counter event, and to see how all of that is mirrored in 2020. Included also in the document a link to the whole article there about full moon, the full moon lunar eclipse in Scorpio. And it's important also to understand the upcoming eclipses in October and November and how these then relate. So, I'm just going to bring up another image here. So this was sent over from this was sent over from a friend of mine, and I think it's helpful here to have an, another understanding of what can we set more positively against all of this darkness and um, quite intimidating. Um, evil of these descriptions of Medusa. And I'd just like to set this against it, which is which is from a friend of mine. So, why this image here? Well, I think here is the, first of all, it has a, a bit more upbeat, positive energy here. And this is one of the, the beauty that can come in the modern world. And if we take this spiral, the spiral that forms this hardened horn, and we understand this as, as our intellectual thinking that can get so hardened. Again, we can make reference back to this Jesuit principle. If our thinking becomes so hardened down to form this horn coming out of this area where the third eye should be, and then imaginatively we think this back. So we spin this backwards and use the possibility of our thinking to come back and rediscover our body anew. This is where the wings take shape. And it's very lovely how the hair is also this blonde, silvery, gray hair has grown so long. The wings form, we have this, the pink of the body. This is how we can start to grow our understanding of occult realities in the present time, but it has to go on a reverse direction, not the intellect that hardens itself down ever deeper into a more materialistic science, but rather how can we use concepts, anthroposophical concepts, astrological concepts, to take us back into this forming of a new body represented here in a kind of tongue in cheek way, with this pink unicorn, transparent purple wings. More traditionally, more traditionally, let's look here. More traditionally, let's look here at what is this new body?
this joy, the potential new body appearing to us, firstly in the etheric, is then Christ, the return of Christ in the etheric. And we see here at first, this is leaving some of the disciples completely overwhelmed, unconscious, falling into sleep. And yet the events of the time are all pointing towards this new influx of light. You see, the whole composition is pointing towards this mystery from the possessed, demon possessed young man here, pointing up to the need for this new advent of Christ in the clouds. Now, if we refer this back to our understanding of those great conjunctions around the time of Golgotha, we have then, first of all, the the message given out that the, the first of all, the initiates are going to understand that this is taking place, seeking out um, Christ as he's born in, in Bethlehem. Secondly, however, we have the community of disciples as they come to form a whole biography, a whole history around that teaching of Christ. And that's what's represented in in that transfiguration scene. And then thirdly, in the third conjunction with Paul on the road to Damascus, as we understand this new relationship to Christ in the etheric, then we can understand how we can come to develop this new resurrection body. What's the best image for this? We have here the probably the best image for this is um, from Grunewald. So let's we'll just show this here. So this is like a glowing in matter of the resurrection body of Christ. Now, understanding how these things are inextricably linked to events that are going on in the world for all of humanity in terms of the social system, the economic system, politics, culture, all of these things are prompts for us to understand our own individual relationship, our own individual karma in relationship to the development of history. And this is a very different understanding of Christ. This is how we understand Christ as our own responsibility for the development of humanity and for the development of that history. So in many ways, the challenge since 2020, if we bring a lot of this together, is to understand how the human being, the individual, is related to the events in history playing out on the world stage and how this gives us an opportunity, first of all, to change our life, to turn our life in repentance, we could say, to make that first step to seek out Christ, a new esoteric understanding of what this means, 
Secondly, to start to awaken to this etheric reality of Christ around us. And thirdly, to intensify this, to start to form a new body. Now, this is something that is so diametrically opposed to the materialistic appreciation of science. And yet, through that challenge of materialistic science, we are called ever more to refine, to make clearer our understanding of spiritual concepts to understand what's going on. So whether this is from the development, developments in medicine or developments in technology or communication technology, these are not things to be rejected, but they're things to be deepened and brought in relationship to a spiritual understanding of the different members of the human being. So whether this is the etheric body or the astral body or the physical body is understanding how these things fit together so that we can understand how technology can aid us in finding the paths and the understanding that we need to bring more of a relationship in society, in culture, in the economy to the spiritual world and how that can start to influence events to a greater extent. Now, of course, this brings a challenge. We have the challenge of the resistant powers, <clears throat> which is reflected in all these historical understandings. So if we look at this battle between light and dark, this is exactly where we need to come into and transform the events that happened in the last century and the events that continue to happen so that these can be brought into a, a healing, uh, creative uh, relationship to the development of, ha of humanity and not a descent into continual chaos. So this is part of the challenge. So going back here to the document. Sorry, bear with me. So we might want us to, to identify some of the um, key ideas here that come in uh, lecture one of Jesus to Christ. Now the importance here is to the authority rather than personal experience and understanding. So the appeal to experts over um, ideal and thinking appreciation of what's going on. So the, the focus here is on group dynamics and their manipulation rather than aesthetics. So rather than coming to work together and understand each other from different perspectives, this is top down control saying, this is how things will be, and the use of group makes the force people in certain directions. Again, I'm not going to spell this out. Um, the assertion of material power in the world, rather than facilitating this spiritual influx, again, we can see these oppositions all over in many phenomena in, in the modern world. Now, the, the deepest aspect is the use of the occult to assert the power of one group over another. So again, the Rosicrucian impulse is a, a far more um, egalitarian and progressive view of how society and history should develop to facilitate 
um, this, this spiritual influx. So the, the description here I've got is of Christ and the etheric. <clears throat> I've also picked up on another aspect of Rosicrucianism, which is understanding different beings and how they speak to us and relate to us. And this is part of deeper understanding of the importance of meditation in this time of also the first class, which was the subject of the last course, but looking at the relationship between Christ, Vidar as an archangel, and Michael as a new time spirit. So these are our deeper understandings of the present time in relationship to spiritual beings. So these are this is probably the subject of another talk here, but just detailing here the three resistant powers of Lucifer, Araman, and occult Azuric control. And again, part of Rosicrucianism is understanding these things so that we can consciously follow their effects in the world and in ourselves and see our challenges in relationship to these spirits of darkness. All of this is building our appreciation of, of the threshold to the spiritual world and also what it means to live over the threshold to the spiritual world and the problems here of the doppelganger of fear as we see, see it um, throughout society also the the mocking of anyone who would want to try and understand uh, things in it's the spiritual world in this direction, the materialist is going is inevitably going to mock um, any drive to understand these things. And this again is part of understanding psychology in the modern time. And again, the problem of lame lameness of the of feeling lamed by all the challenges, quite understandably that are facing all of us at this time. So this is how the threshold is built. And what we've also been looking at here is how this threshold builds the three beasts of the threshold and how understanding this, how to set courage, enthusiasm and spiritual knowledge against these three beasts. This is how we traverse, how we step over the threshold to the spiritual world. So part of the course that we're doing here is looking through at the um, to form this better relationship to Christ and understanding the return of Christ in the etheric and the resurrection body. We're looking at the Gospel of Matthew. Now, part of um, the homework that I'm giving people on this course is to take a passage from the Gospel of Matthew and form your own deeper imaginative relationship to this passage. And then through doing this, we're looking at how the Akashic record is starting to speak to us about the true events that happened at that time and to measure them against what is written in the Gospel of Matthew. And this is part of an occult tradition of looking and deepening our understanding of the Akashic record of the true events that happen, measuring them against what we are told happened and starting to recognize real living pictures of what happened as opposed to what we're told. And this, again, if we think of all of the problems of the 20th century, it's understanding what really happened in history and what we're told happened. And do, in our own lives too, what is it that was happening in a spiritual sense and what happened on the outer stage of what our memory tells us? So it's again, working with the memory is a very Saturnian thing. And Jupiter is recognizing these, this twofold aspect, of the doppelganger, of what I feel, maybe the lie of what happened and the truth of what happened. This is very much, again, this discussion between Jupiter and Saturn. So, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, we have the passage 
Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. This passage, if we then deepen it and think and form a relationship to this in our own inner lives, we'll see really words. These are words ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Just the idea here of a door that can open our understanding to things that we didn't know previously. This is a great message for the present time in this world where we're often told what to think and how to perceive and what to think life is and how to look at history. This is saying to us, turn inward, find the knowledge, go on a path of development that can help you open that door to see what is your karma, what is your own relationship to the story of humanity. Find the way to form that relationship to Christ so that that door opens and you see with new eyes what is going on, not only in your own life, but in the world at large. So I've just finished up here with a number of links, again, recapitulating some of the underlying themes that are surrounding this 1920 to 2020 hundred year anniversary. Also the link between the First World War and Rudolf Steiner's trip to the UK in 1922 and the possibility of a new economic impulse. And all of these unresolved issues. So instead of Germany, the Axis and the Allies, we've now got this new dialectic, China, Russia, USA. These are all things to reflect on and see where we are called to change, where we are called to engage with what is going on. So I I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I'll put, like I said, I'll put links down below, and um, we have the Anthroposophical Facebook group, which I'll post this to. Also Patreon. If you want to come and join the course, I'll be doing up videos like this as we go on as we go deeper into the gospel of matthew deeper into the jesus to christ lecture series from steiner and yeah if you want to come along yeah feel free um we've got a small group at the moment uh about four people and we'll be continuing going deeper into these subjects as we progress <clears throat>